Welcome to another great video today. Talking real estate, rents have gone up, mortgages have gone up. We've talked rent versus buy before. We're going to do it again today in the new context. And it makes sense why we'd be talking about this today, Kevin, because there's been a few changes in the last couple of years. You may have noticed the first one, if you're going to buy a house, well, mortgage rates, they have skyrocketed, haven't they, in the last little while? Yeah, I mean, the biggest factor that's come around in the last little while is inflation. Inflation through 2022 shot to the moon that we haven't seen in 40 mm -hmm. years. So all of a sudden, how are you going to combat that? Well, you combat that by increasing interest rates. You increase interest rates, what follows? Mortgage rates increase. And the minute you increase mortgage rates, now all of a sudden we have something that we have to deal with. We've been in a historically low interest rate environment. You've had that 2 3%. Mortgages have never been really over five in the last <laughs> couple of decades. So you've had that very big privilege that you've been able to get homes at a real cheap rate. Now, does it make more sense to have that or should we be looking at rent? What is the comparison between the two yeah. and how do these things go? But it does not just happen in a vacuum. Rent, or pardon me, no. mortgage has gone up like you just explained. Rent has also increased. This is from uh, yeah. rentals.ca. This is the September 2023 report and they ranked 35 cities in Canada based on how much I took one bedroom. There's lots of data in rentals.ca. I just wanted a comparison. Said, all right, let's pick a one bedroom apartment across various cities in Vancouver, Kevin, almost three grand a month for that one I bedroom know. apartment. And that's a 13% increase from September of 2022. Huge. You can see the various other cities there. Saskatoon, uh, the cheapest at about a thousand bucks. Vancouver, the highest at about 3000, many Canadian cities in between. But the idea there is on average, you've also seen a bump in rent. So it's not as if there's a one size fits all. Everyone should rent because mortgage rates went up. Unfortunately, mortgage rates went up and rents cost also went up. And you can see a bit of a pattern here, Kevin. Ontario, BC, they kind of dominate the top portion of that chart, don't they? Yes, they do. And I mean, that's that's basically the biggest factor that you take a look at. Where are the two largest cities, Vancouver and Toronto? And if you look at it, a lot of the stuff is around those areas. Langley, Surrey, Bury. Those are all basically suburbs of Vancouver. You look at Mississauga, you look at Brampton, you know, you're looking at a variety of Again, bedroom communities around that Toronto area. Oh, yeah. So if the one area is going up, the rest of it's doing it. And if we notice, the majority of those rents have gone up in almost every place. So again, it, it's not like it hasn't had an effect on it because of the interest rates that have gone up and the inflation. So that's where the comparisons have got to come in. Is it is it easier to do that rent or is it yeah. easier you know, to buy the home even with the higher interest rates that we've had right now? That's, that's the big scenario that we have to take a look at. Yeah, and we're going to tackle it from a couple of ways. We'll start off with some financial comparisons, some data, yeah. and then we'll get into some non-financial items as well. But first off, you can't just compare mortgage trend. I know it's easy because no. they, they both give you a monthly number. Say hey, I'm paying three grand a month to rent and the mortgage is only 3,100 and but I get to own it. Let's just make that comparison. $100 difference makes sense to buy. No, because that's not the true cost of home ownership. If only it was that easy where you just pay the mortgage and that's it. Of course, there's lots of else that comes along with being a homeowner and we're going to cover that. So let's look at some of the financial components here, the rent versus buy. What are the costs if you're a renter? Well, obviously you pay rent. You're going to need some yep. kind of utilities. Utilities I'm using quite broadly here. Maybe you're paying for, for some electricity. Maybe you got a cell phone bill, whatever it is. But you lump that into utilities. Then you're going to have insurance. As a homeowner, Kevin, you're going to have more cost. Yes, you have utilities insurance. First off, they're normally more expensive as a homeowner than as a renter. But then you get the joy of paying property tax every single year. You're going to have maintenance because... Houses fall apart. You're going to have to keep them up to date with uh, repair and ongoing stuff. And then in addition, that last item there, and we'll talk a little more about it, but opportunity cost of equity in the home. You're putting money, essentially an investment in real estate. When you get equity in that home, you could have had that money elsewhere in a different investment. So there's going to be an opportunity cost there. So we'll talk about that as well. I should mention Ben Felix, PWL Capital. He has some great videos on this, and we're kind of leveraging that concept here with the 5% rule. But why don't you walk us through some of these pieces here, Kevin, starting with the privilege of paying property tax as a homeowner. <laughs> well, yeah, the 5% rule is something that, you know, really most people don't consider. You, you've mentioned it in a nutshell. What they do is they compare, mm -hmm. what am I paying in a mortgage to what am I paying in rent? And that's the only thing that goes on. And of course, as we've mentioned right here, that's not reality. You have to include other things. Property tax, it's the ability that you're taxed because you own certain property and, and this is basically money you have to throw away. This is so that they can cover services in your industry, whether it's you know sewer, mm -hmm. whether it's water or anything else. That's part of why you pay property tax because you're the owner of this and you're the one that should be able to deal with it. And if you take an average on that, that's one to one and a half percent. Depends on where your home is uh, as to whether it's gonna be higher or lower, but that is part of the annual amount that you have to pay. So again, people will say it's like throwing money away. Well, you get the services, but 
you're right. It's money that you don't have to do. And maintenance, well, in the apartment, nine times out of 10, something goes wrong, you're going to call the super. But if it's yeah. in your own place, you know, I got to fix the roof because something happened. The lawnmower broke. I can't deal with anything here. Uh, you know, I need painting done. There's chipping on the stucco. I've got to make sure that the yard's looked after. All those mm -hmm. things have a cost to them per year. And that's something that you really don't have in an apartment, but it is there. And of course, the last one we mentioned, the cost of opportunity, right? You're putting it into here as an investment, as opposed to, you know, if I take it and put it in the stock market. So of course, cost of equity in home will vary based on risk tolerance. Is it, if we use that sort of two to 3% is the fair estimate, adding these numbers up, that gets us our 5% rule. Yeah. And that's a number that has to be considered when you're dealing with home ownership compared to renting. Yeah, and before we go too far, I'm going to quickly mention a, mm. we always hear, and this is a refrain I'm trying to fight against because I don't think it's necessarily true. It kind of leads us down the wrong path. But the idea that, oh, you rent, you're just throwing your money away. Well, arguably property tax is kind of like rent for homeowners because you don't get yep. a lot in return, but you got to pay it every single time, every year, That's regardless. Right. Uh, so you kind of pay rent either way, whether you rent or whether you own a home, there's some component where you have forced to make these payments that aren't necessarily connected uh, to your asset there. So that concept could apply in both cases. Uh, and also when we hear people talk about real estate, I think this is kind of cultural. Like you talk to neighbors, hey, I bought a house and then I sold it, we did really well. They normally tell you about what they paid for it and then what they got when they sold it and nothing in between. But that in between is very important to whether or not you made money. If you bought a house 15 years ago for 100 grand, you sold it today for 700 grand. Well, that's fantastic. But you've paid $5,000 of property tax every single year for 15 years. And then you redid the kitchen, you added some siding, you bought a new lawnmower. Well, you add in all those other costs. Well, maybe the gain isn't quite as large as you're making it seem with that story. And I get it. We're humans. We love stories. We love narratives. In fact, we have a whole video on how to kind of fight back against the noise and the narratives to stick to your overall plan. We'll link to that video. Just mentioning it here that it also applies to real estate. The ideality, the idea that we kind of tell a story and we ignore some of those middle pieces. But back to the 5% rule, you explained it quite well there. A good example of that 5% rule in action. Let's say you had a $750,000 home. Well, you use the 5% rule, 5% of that is at $37,500 or roughly $3,125 a month. So we're trying to take in the extra cost here, the property tax, the maintenance, the cost of equity. And then you say, all right, if I could rent this place, equivalent house for $3,125 or less, well, then it'd make more sense to rent. Or if the rent is higher than that, well, then the buying is now a good deal. But again, you're not just looking at the mortgage here. You're including some of those other factors, which is a better way to do it uh, when you're trying to make a, an apples to apples comparison there. Does that make sense when you're looking at the 5% rule, Kevin? Yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly. You have to consider what these are. I mean, this is an extra added cost that goes on. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's something that is really there. It is reality. This is what you do not add in. As you say, everybody glosses over what's going on. You're comparing strictly rent to what the mortgage cost is. It's like when you hear the big gambler that wins everything, they'll tell you what they won, but they won't tell you everything they lost in between yeah. before they ever got the big win. So these all have to be considered. And again, assuming that you own the home. Now, if you finance it with a mortgage, we really yeah. do have to consider that. It, we assumed on the 5% rule, you bought the house outright and you just strictly own that. But that's mm -hmm. not usually the case. Nobody can really go yeah. in and just buy the property. So you're going to have mortgage on top of that, which means now you have to add an interest cost on top of the other stuff that we've done with the 5% yeah. rule. So As this we, says right here in the, uh, the cost example capital, we're yeah. looking at, we we're don't putting wanna... it 10% down. And then, yeah, we don't know. want to turn it into like a whole finance course here, but uh, we'll, no. we'll explain a little bit of the cost of capital. So you do have the cost of debt, the cost of equity. Cost of equity is what you explained a moment ago with the opportunity cost. You're putting money in one area instead of in a different area and you're tying it up. And then the interest, right? Mortgage rates, like we talked about, they jumped. They're no longer 2 3%. Now they're in the, the 6% zone. So if you put a 10% down payment, and you get 90% of a mortgage, well, that's gonna change your cost of capital because you're gonna have 90% at that 6% interest rate. And again, this will change over time, but we're just doing a quick example so you can understand the concept here. And what does that look like, Kevin? It changes the 5% rule into maybe a bigger number if you're factoring in that interest. Yeah, you gotta use seven now all of a sudden because again, what we dealt with beforehand was we had the property tax, the maintenance. Well, now your cost of capital doesn't have just the 2%, but also the percentage that you've added on for your mortgage. And again, 10% down seems like a very realistic or, or amount for most people, if that's the case, they're not putting 25. That's gonna give us a closer point at that five and a half to 6% range. So now 7% is probably on the low end, but that's what you have to consider. So all of a sudden now, if you're using this rule, 
you know, that 3125 from our previous example is going to be much higher. And hey, all of a sudden, yeah. rent is looking like a much cheaper option than anything you'd have to use if you're going strictly into buying the home. Yeah. And just uh, as an aside there, I, we don't want to get encourage folks, hey, we got a needy, uh, every single little detail here of the financial piece. I think 5% is a good ballpark. It's a nice round number. Yes. It kind of explains the concept. You factor in some property tax, some other items. I think it's a nice rule to use. And Ben Felix talked about that in uh, his videos as well. But then more importantly, it's not just about finance. It's more to life than yep. math. There's some other factors you have to consider. Lifestyle certainly being one of them. And I think this is true for many folks, Kevin, if you rent, and we see this as folks retire off and they downsize, they downsize to a rental. That's common. Yeah. And the reason they do it is for the flexibility, right? You're not tied down. They want to go travel. They want to go spend time with the grandkids. Maybe they live in a different part of the country. Well, if you own a home, it's a little harder to do all that. If you rent, you have a little more flexibility, right? Yeah, I mean, it becomes one of two things, right? I mean, maybe when you're growing up and you're raising the family and everything else, you want to be at home. This may be the thing that you want to do. So that's exactly the place you want to be. You're not going and doing a lot of traveling. You're just, you're spending the time here. You're raising the kids. You may have a large two bedroom or something along those lines. Whereas you get a little older, maybe you want that flexibility. And that's where the apartment comes in, right? I don't need that home anymore. I don't want the maintenance. I don't want to look after it, but the rent will allow me to do exactly what I want to do. Yeah. And you get that just depending on lifestyle, as you mentioned beforehand. Those are huge factors in deciding whether home or rent becomes bigger for you. That's that it, it, it's what you want to do with your life as you go forward. And you know, it used to be that everybody had to have a home. Nowadays, you got a lot of the younger version that just, you know what, I don't want to have that maintenance. I don't want to look after it. I want to live my life doing this that may be the option that they have to take a look at. Yeah, and a quick reminder, if you have questions, we get questions of this nature all the time. We're happy to take them. Go to chatwithclintonkevin.com, fill in the form, comes right to us, and we'll be more than happy to get back to you and address the question. Continuing the non-financial aspects, talk lifestyle, talk flexibility related to that would be the commute. Maybe not so much if you're able to work from home nowadays, but if you lived in a big city, uh, oh, often, yeah. If you want to afford a place you can't live in the urban center, you end up getting a place that's a little further out of town, which means you're doing that commute back and forth. That's a lifestyle factor. That can be a big headache. And maybe if you can rent closer to your job, you save that commute. That's certainly something to keep in mind. Another non-financial uh, item, but kind of related to that, is this whole concept of forced savings, right? Our prior analogy there, Kevin, has said, well, rent versus buy, the financial piece, you got to take property tax maintenance, but if you're saving that money as a renter, we're assuming you're investing it, right? You're taking that yes. savings and you're putting it somewhere else. If you just spend it, you're not really getting any of the benefits of being a renter. So buying the house kind of locks you in to that real estate investment, right? Yeah. And I mean, that's the biggest factor, right? I mean, let's point facts at the end of the day. People always said, well, I don't ever want to rent because all I'm doing is throwing my money away. I never have to worry mm -hmm. about it. And again, I mean, reality being, if you're not putting any savings away, you are. You're doing it that way. And at the end of the time frame, you don't have an asset, whereas the home will always give you that asset, sort of like leasing a car compared to owning it. You always have something there that you can hold on to. But if you're putting the money away using that opportunity cost that the house would have had, all of a sudden now, maybe you've built up something. So, you know, the apartment rent is not as big a deal anymore. It's sort of like it's a lifestyle choice that you want to do. And that forced savings that's going in. So that's where another comparison is. I mean, if I'm buying the house, yeah, I'm forced to save. I'm buying that house. I'm paying that mortgage mm -hmm. down. This is something I get concrete at it. If you're not doing it on the other side, then again, not a wash. You have to make sure that, as we mentioned in the beginning, mortgage and rent are not the same thing, and it's not an equal comparison all the time. No, and it's behavioral here. That's kind of the point is when you have that mortgage, it forces you to put the money aside. You need to yes. pay for the house. And in doing so, you're, you're actually investing in real estate because you're building equity in the property. So it's kind of behavioral. If you don't think you'd be able to save as a renter, well, the mortgage kind of forces you to save in your real estate property. And then the last piece here, and this is kind of an important one, why do we do all the financial stuff in the beginning? Well, you have to have a goal, you have to have a purpose. Most people want to be happy in life. And there's a little bit of data, believe it or not, on this very topic compared to homeowners. I'll just pull uh, two of them up here. We don't have to go over this uh, ad nauseum, but this is from a Swiss study. And I pulled this particular one because they mentioned global research has shown mixed results so far in terms of whether or not home ownership actually makes people happy. And then their specific findings is that there's really no or even negative evidence that it has any kind of contribution to happiness. Other factors, and this isn't really a surprise, like the financial status, the household, health, age, the strength of your partnership, they have a bigger impact on your happiness than whether or not you're a homeowner. And I mentioned that because I know in Canada, we kind of get tied up. It's like a cultural rite of passage. You own a house, you become a homeowner. 
And it doesn't actually make you any happier, according to the data. And one last one here, Kevin, and I think this one would make a lot of sense for folks. This comes from a book from Happy Money, The Science of Smarter Spending by Elizabeth Dunn and Michael Norton. There's a bigger connection between debt and unhappiness than there is between money and happiness. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, basically, you know, that's that's the key factor. We hear it all the time today is, you know, Canada's increasing in debt. And of course, people mm -hmm. are not happy with it. They're trying to live off credit cards. And it puts you in a really sad state. So, I mean, if you've got that mortgage payment that's higher, that could have a real big detriment on you. And again, I mean, the home ownership thing is pretty simple. I mean, you get it sort of like retirement, that euphoria because I bought the home. But all of a sudden, when it sets in, it's, oh my gosh, this isn't a payment yeah. I have to have and everything. Do I really need all this? And you're seeing friends doing this and this. But you can't because you got to get that payment. So yeah, I mean, home ownership has its 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 a ability for great quality, but by the same token, not having that big payment, not having that debt is a huge factor going forward. It certainly is, certainly is. We covered lots in this video. We talked quite a bit about real estate. Uh, we also have another video about how to hedge inflation. We talked about real estate in that one too. So if you like this one, you'll certainly love that one. Take care, everyone. We'll be back again soon. Take care.